or restart. Where is that? Where? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the music. <coughs> that just gives me a. Okay, let's go back to Facebook. And here, now click go live. Light, honey. Okay, so that's going to go by itself. That's good. Okay, and let's go back over here. And that's on. Okay, we're good. So help me because I'm. Amen. All right. How are we doing? Great. We're good? Yes, sir. All right. Good deal. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. All right, there we go. We back on? Okay. All right, so we found what it was. Sorry, people. Let's go ahead and fix this. All right, let's get back out here. All right, guys, we got it fixed. We got it fixed. All right, guys, let me know if the sound is on. I have my phone here, so I'm listening. I'm, I'm looking at the comments. Give me a thumbs up if the sound is on, if it sounds good. 
guys let me know. All right, so again, we're back. All right, so let me go ahead and uh, uh, kind of start over here. Of course, you know, I'm not, I'm not Pastor Pena, but I look like him, right? Uh, again, my name is Gilbert, Gilbert Gomez. Um, and right now, um, uh, what was I talking about? Ryan. Ryan is in Colorado right now, and he's co-writing a book with, with Dub Alexander. And so we just, I mean, we're, we're excited for that, um, for a book that they're co-writing together on, on the kingdom. And, and I believe that um, it's, kind of, it's the kind of book that, that is, is relevant for today, is necessary for today, is critical for today. Um, and I just believe it's going to impact so many people across the world. So we're excited for this book, and we'll keep them in prayer. Um, also for January, uh, 2022, January the 14th, 15th, um, we're going to be in Tucson, Arizona. So that's going to be powerful. Um, of course I'll be going out there. I'll be doing the, the, um, the sound and the media and the live stream and things like that. But, uh, as far as the speakers is going to be Ryan, uh, Ryan Pena, Brandon Pena and Dub Alexander. So, and, and there's going to be, uh, uh, several others that are going to be there. Um, just prophets from around um, the Arizona area that, that God is just gathering. So that's something to, to look forward to, to be excited about. Um, the event, if you're going in person, the event is free. All right. So all you got to do is just register online. You go to coatc.org. All right. coatc.org. Um, and just register online if you're going to be there in person. Okay. It's free. But if you can't make it, uh, in person to to Arizona, you know, with flights or travels and hotels and things like that. We are going to be live streaming. Um, the only thing about the live stream, though, it's it's a, a small fee of thirty nine dollars, um, and you'll catch all the session all the sessions. Um, we've never charged for an event before. This is going to be the first time that we're actually doing something like that. But it's mainly because of the expenses that 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 are going out. Um, of course, everything costs for the conference room, the hotels, everything that, that we're going to be going out there. And that's mainly the main reason why. We want to, you know, bless the speakers and stuff. But that's the main reason why. Um, but other than that, if you're going in person, just, hey, it's free. Amen. Uh, let's see. So <clears throat> I guess that's, that's it. And I kind of want to get, I'm a little bit everywhere today um, because the topic is so critical and so huge that I want it to be, an introduction that I feel is going to be coming in the forefront as we continue to get revelation on the kingdom. We're going to work. We continue to get understanding on the kingdom. There's an unfolding of, of, of understanding. There's an unfolding of understanding. There's an unfolding of experiencing the kingdom that there's going to be, there's, there's doctrines, and concepts and beliefs that are contrary to the kingdom advancing. Amen? And so a lot of those doctrines, beliefs, and understandings and misconceptions, they're going to be, they're going to butt heads with the advancing kingdom. Amen? And one of those things, and it's very critical in the body of Christ, and I'm talking about all over the world, is the understanding of eschatology. Eschatology is some fancy big word for simply that just means about what's going to happen in the last days. Or let me put it like this. It's your understanding or what you believe to be the last days. Okay? This is very critical because what I've seen is that there, everybody who has a breath of air in their lungs, whether you're a believer or not, listen to me. Everybody has an eschatology. In some form, some fashion, or some way, there's a hint of influence of eschatology in their minds, right? And so eschatology, a lot of people can say it's the, the end times. They can say it's the last days, right? Or even um, prophecy, right? In some, in some denominations, they, could, they, they call it prophecy, right? But even if you're a believer, have never been in a church, 
you still in some way have been affected or have even a small piece of eschatology in your mind through the media, through TV, through movies. In some form or, fa or fashion, you have some kind of inclination of, oh, well, it's the last days. Something that has influenced our thinking. But a lot of it has not been influenced by the victorious, advancing kingdom that has been established by Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> this uh, this uh, last night, I had a dream. And I kind of want to set the premise for this because in my dream, I was calling someone. I made a phone call to somebody. And I disguised my voice as, as an old historian, <clears throat> a, a figure in history. And when this person answered the phone, I said, hi. Right? I changed my voice. I was like, well, hello. My name is Mickey Mantle. Right? And if you don't know who Mickey Mantle is, he's a, he's, he's a famous baseball player from, from a long time ago. And... His autograph is one of the most wanted, desired autographs, right, around. It's worth, you know, it's, it's very valuable. And so I'm telling this person on the other phone, I said, hey, my name is Mickey Mantle, and I'm calling you because I'll, I'm going to send you my autograph baseball card. And so this person was like, speechless, speechless. And they were very, very quiet. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I can hear myself in this voice saying that I'm Mickey Mantle. But this person is not responding back. And I'm like, hello, are you there, ma'am? Hello? And the person's like, yes, I'm sorry I took so long. I was getting my husband on the line because I wanted him to hear this. Right? And I was like, oh, okay, well, wonderful. Well, you're the recipient. You're going to get my new card. And I'm going to autograph it myself. This is Mickey Mantle. Goodbye. Right? And I remember sleeping but I remember waking up laughing because I knew I was just, it wasn't really Mickey Mantle, right? And so when I started asking the Lord this morning about what this dream was, the Lord started talking to me about authenticity. Authenticity. What does authenticity mean? It means the authentic, the real, the true, the genuine, right? What is true, what is real, what is genuine. What is the opposite of authenticity? Counterfeit, lie, right? A distortion, okay? Um, a fake, okay? A copy, right? A, a, a phony, okay? So there's authenticity and then there's the false, right? And, and this, is, this is one of the things that we have to remember about authenticity is that authenticity determines the value of something. Okay, let, let, me, let me give you an example. For example, if I were to, if Mickey Mantle were to autograph his card and me as a buyer, I'm going to purchase that card because it's got Mickey Mantle's signature on it. One of the first things I want to do as a smart uh purchaser, I want to make sure that that autograph is authentic. Is it the true authentic signature? Because that authentic or that authenticity will determine the value of that card. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if it's authentically autographed by Mickey Mantle himself, then that, that, that value would skyrocket. But after evaluation, if I see that it's not authentic, it's a counterfeit signature, it devalues that object or that thing. Does that make sense? And so right now, there's an, there's an authentic kingdom arising right now. There is an authentic authenticity of the kingdom that is being manifested right now in our time in history. So it's very, very critical that we um, discern what is authentic and what is not, right? Because what does a counterfeit mean? A counterfeit is, 
is a copy or it's trying to be something that's authentic, but it's not. Right? It's trying to be something that it's not. Okay? <clears throat> so there's an, authentic, there's an authenticity that is arising in the kingdom that without a shadow of a doubt, we're going to know that is God's doing. Amen? And so, what does that have to do with eschatology? So, in eschatology, there has been a mixture of, mix, of misunderstandings from left to right, right? What I want to do here today is just kind of lay out a foundation, a quick little foundation. I'm not going to have all the answers today. I'm not going to have all, everything in one sitting and, and explain all of, of eschatology today. I won't be able to. There's not enough time for that. But there is a, um, a series. There's a teaching. There's going to be a curriculum. There's going to be classes that we're going to be putting together. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tackle the whole issue of eschatology. And what did Jesus really mean in the scriptures when he talked about the last days? This is very important. This is a topic that needs to be discussed and evaluated for authenticity because of the value that is behind it. Does that make sense? Okay. So, when we, when we talk about eschatology, we have these um, familiar concepts. We have these familiar ideas that, and terms that we've heard before, right? <clears throat> Great Tribulation. We've heard of rapture. We've heard of, you know, abomination of desolation. We've heard of the second coming. We've heard of the millennial reign. We've heard of all these concepts. But what do they mean? And what did Jesus mean when he said these terms or these things when he was talking about? Okay. <clears throat> so again, I'm just laying an introduction to understanding the scriptures and what Jesus really meant. Amen? <clears throat> so one of the things that when discussing eschatology, right, because a lot of times when the, when the subject or the topic or the discussion or the teaching kicks off in the context of eschatology, immediately one of the scriptures one of the passages or the chapters that we turn to is Matthew 24. Immediately, we think of Matthew 24. Immediately, okay? So, <clears throat> I'm going to go to the board here really quick. And Belinda, if you could just follow me here for a second. And I'm just going to put Matthew 24. Right? Because this is where immediately we begin to read and try to understand what Jesus was talking about. Now, there's something here that we're going to talk about first. Let's, we got to lay this down first. Because one of the things that's very, very important in understanding eschatology is that you have to, you have to know events. Okay, um, a couple of years ago, I was teaching third and fourth grade here at our academy here at Church of Acts. And we were, in a, we were in the subject of history in the books, and we were in the part of the book where I started talking about 9-11. Do you remember 9-11? September 11th, 2001. It was approximately 20 years ago. It's been 20 years. It's been 20 years. And so when I was teaching a class of third and fourth graders, I'm talking about, do y'all remember September 11th? And they were like, no. And it dawned on me, it hit me like a ton of bricks, like, oh my gosh, they weren't even born. So the people that were 20 years and younger were not even born yet to have experience or even understand 
this critical day. It was, it, was a, it was a big day in history for the United States, right? And I say that because historically, to understand Matthew 24, you have to understand the historical context of what's taking place in that time. Now, there's a thing called reader relevance. And I'll just put it right here. Reader, and let me know if I spell it correctly. It's relevance. Reader relevance. What does that mean? What this means is when the scriptures were written, we have to keep in mind the reader who is reading it at that moment, at that time. Okay? So I'm going to draw a quick little line here. It's not straight, but you understand. And here, I'm going to put... Um, let me do this. I'll just do this right here. What year was Jesus born? Jesus was born in 2000 and what? <laughs> All right. It's either four or three B.C. Right. Three or four B.C. When was Jesus crucified? Because he was 33 years old. So in this line period, there's no zero. Historically, in time, there is no zero year. Okay? So he was 33 years old. Jesus was crucified in 30 AD. All right? So this is the context here. Okay? There's a very big critical event that took place historically that not a lot of um, believers know about. Okay? And it's a very critical event that took place in 70 AD. What took place here? Anybody know? That's right. This was the destruction of Jerusalem. Did I spell that correctly? Okay. So in 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. This is very huge and critical and big. <clears throat> because the temple... Um, how do I draw this? I'm going to just put a building like this. Okay. That's the temple. The temple, which was Herod's temple, which was the second temple. Okay. Let's remember that the first temple was what? Solomon's temple. It was Solomon's temple. It was destroyed. It was rebuilt. Because they were taken from, into Babylon. And then they reconstructed it. So Solomon's temple was rebuilt. This was the time. And then, and then Herod, who was the king of, of this time, this time period, he went and added to it and extended it. Right? It, he, he went from, I think, 14-acre Solomon's temple to 37-acre uh, Herod's temple. Okay? So it's much bigger, much elaborate, more gold, more everything. Okay? Massive. Herod's temple was in the time of Jesus. Okay? Remember, Herod's temple in, in, in that day, this was the house of God in their, in their mind frame. Their understanding was nothing could ever take this, this place down. This is God's house. God built it with his own hands. That kind of mindset. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, to fathom the idea that a temple would be destroyed was something that they could never, ever comprehend. Okay? So, I have to say that because this is where 
all the rituals were taking place. This is where all the sacrifices were being, were being done. This is where all the feasts, right, when, when they would gather and they would come from all over the region and the area. Everybody would come to Jerusalem to celebrate, to sacrifice, and, and, and forgiveness of sins, and all that good stuff. So this was monumental, okay? This was huge for this temple to exist at that time. But then Jesus shows up, right? He's a, he, it, one of the things that Jesus says, he says, I'll destroy this temple. You can destroy this temple, but in three days, raise it up. Right? He's talking about himself. But there's a passage where he talks about this temple. Right? Remember, it exists throughout this whole time, this temple standing. He says, well, this, this temple that not one stone will be left upon another. Okay? And we're going to look at that. But I, I, have to, I, I have to explain the context of what's taking place. Okay? <clears throat> So you have to understand 70 A.D. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this just for a brief second because there was over a million Jews that died during this time. When this temple was being destroyed, it was actually being burned down. Flames. Okay? <clears throat> Let's, let's, go to the, let's, let's go to the passage. Let's, let's go to the scriptures here. Because I want to go through some things really fast. Because everybody starts at Matthew 24. Right? I don't want to start at Matthew 24 because that's not where the context begins. We, gotta look at the, we, we have to look at the passages in historical context. And its proper sequence and order of events. Okay? So... The context for Matthew 24 actually begins in Matthew 21. See, so, so already when people start reading Matthew 24 and that begins their eschatology, that's already mistake number one. Mistake number two is not knowing what happened in 70 AD. All right? Mistake number three is not having reader relevance. What did it mean to the people that were reading these passages, what did it mean to the people that are listening to the conversation as Jesus is speaking these words? What did it mean to them? Reader relevance. Because there's no way, I can't, I can't fathom a letter that somebody writes to me, but this letter is meant for somebody 2,000 years from now. I have no idea what that context is, none. Neither do the disciples when they're listening and hearing the words of Jesus. They don't have 2,000 years in the future in their mind. Does that make sense? So, Matthew 21. Now, I'm going to go through some of these passages. I'm not going to go into, into detail. I just want to give a quick broad scan through just to give us a painting a picture of the of the context again this is just an introduction all right before we can get down into the specific details i want to kind of give a broad helicopter view and then we can focus in on the tiny details does that make sense <clears throat> all right so in matthew 21 we're going to go through these really fast, and we're going to be jumping a, a lot, okay? You ready? So in Matthew 21, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. All right, so let's stop right there. Where were they going? They were going to Jerusalem. All right? Pretty simple, Okay? Drop, drop down to verse 10. Same chapter, verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, whoa, now he's in the city. So remember, verse 21, I mean, uh, in verse 1, they're approaching Jerusalem. In verse 10, they're in Jerusalem. 
Are we following along, right? Okay. Now, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple area. So now where is he? In the temple. Okay. So far, so good, right? We're tracking? All right. <clears throat> Go to verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Okay, so who was there? The chief priests and the teachers of the law. Keep this in mind, the place. Where is this at? In the temple. Keep this in mind. There's teachers of the law there. The chief priests. Who are the chief priests? The Sanhedrin, right? Okay. Verse 17 says, and he left them and went out of the city. So now he's not in the city no more. Are we tracking? We're tracking Jesus' his moves, okay? Now, verse 18, early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city. Are we tracking? He left the city, now he's coming back. All right. Verse 23, Jesus entered the temple courts. Where is he? In the temple. All right. We're following Jesus' footsteps here. So Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. All right. <clears throat> now, there's an audience here. The chief priests, teachers of the law, Pharisees, they're all present. And where are they at? In the temple. They're all in the temple. All right? Good, good. Loving this. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked him. And who gave you this authority? So they started questioning him about his authority. Okay? I'm going to read this really fast, even though it's not in the context of what I want to talk about. But it says, Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and they said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men... We are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority am I doing these things. Now, let's get into this parable really fast. Because this is kind of harsh here. Listen to, listen to the parable that Jesus is, who is he conversating with? The teachers, Pharisees of the law. Where are they at? In the temple. Okay. What do you think? There is a man who had two sons. He went to the first and he said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of these two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Who answered? The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, right? They're, having, they're conversating with Jesus. So Jesus questioned them. And they answer back. They respond back to Jesus' question. Which of these two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered, Jesus said to them, I'll tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Ooh. To the Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Listen to another parable. Jesus tells them, right? So he's talking to who? The Pharisees, the tax collectors, right? The, the, I mean, I'm sorry, the Pharisees, the, um, the teachers of the law. He says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a winepress in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers, and he went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit, right? So the landowner, the owner, rented out the vineyard to the tenants. The tenants, verse 35, the tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent his, his other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. Oh, the owner is sending his son. Okay. They will respect my son, he thought. They're going to respect my son. 
But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what, will he, what, will he, what is he going to do to those tenants? And look at their response and look at their answer. Right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the teachers of the law. Watch this. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous on our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Who is he talking to? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. He's saying the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they caught a revelation. They knew that he was talking about them. Did you get that? So the parables that he was mentioning here in, verse, in, in chapter 21, the Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, they understood that Jesus was talking to them. Reader relevance. Who is Jesus talking to? Right? All right. <clears throat> so again, he's still in the temple, right? So chapter 22, we're not going to go into all of it because it's still the conversation that he's, ta- he's, that he's having this. Ver- chapter 22, you can read that on your own, but it's, it's, it's the entire chapter where the conversation is still continuing between Jesus, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the religious teachers. Okay, we're still in the temple. We're still conversating. So let's go to ver- uh, chapter 23. Are we there? So chapter 22, he's still in conversation. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples. So let's, let's, I want to paint this picture for you because Jesus is having this open air conversation with the Sadducees, Pharisees, religious leaders, teachers of the law, right? Okay. The disciples are there, crowds are there, everybody's listening in, right? It's pay-per-view. What is going on here? Okay. Then Jesus says to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Who's he talking about? Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to let the finger to move them. That's pretty harsh. Is he talking to the, is he saying that, oh, the, these disciples? No, he's talking about them. Pharisees, teachers, right? Teachers of the law. So he goes on in this, in, in chapter 23, and he's just, it's like Jesus is not holding back, okay? Because we're, I mean, you're talking about the kingdom of God, people not being allowed to experience the, manifest, the manifestation of the kingdom. So Jesus is like, nope, not having this anymore. Watch this. Go down to verse 13. There are seven woes right here, but I want, I want us to pay attention to who these woes are too. Verse 13 says, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. That's not holding back. Who is he directing it to? Teachers of the law and Pharisees, religious leaders. You set the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves did not enter nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. 
Oh my gosh. Look at verse 16. Woe to you blind guides. Man. Look at verse 23. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Look at verse 25. Woe to you teachers of the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Man. Look at verse 27. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Look at verse 29. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Look at verse 33. You snakes, you brood of vipers. Look at verse 35. And so upon you will come all the righteousness, the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. So who is he talking to? The teachers of the law, Pharisees, Sadducees, right? He calls them hypocrites. So he says, all this is going to come upon this generation. The thing is, what is a generation? What's a generation? 40 years. So when you go from 30 AD when Jesus died to 40 AD, 40 years. Did you catch that? One generation. And he says, these things are going to take place on this generation. Hmm. So you're telling me that, that, that these things are not going to take place in the year 2035? Hmm. Verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those that sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks, her, her chicks under her wings, we are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Hmm. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Here's a conversation taking place. We read, we went through chapter 21. He was in and out of the city. Last, we know that the conversation is taking place in the temple where the Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, disciples are there, the crowd is there, and he's giving the, the seven woes, brood of vipers, you snakes, and all this is going to happen in this generation. Now watch this. Remember, they're in the temple. So now, let's go to Matthew 24. We have the context, right? Matthew 24, you ready? Jesus left the temple. Oh. And was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to, to what? To its buildings. To what buildings? Of the temple. So they're leaving the temple. The disciples say, hey, Jesus, these... um." And it gave his attention to the buildings. Verse 2. What does Jesus say? Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth. <clears throat> Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Every stone will be thrown down. But what is he talking about? The temple. This whole thing is coming down. So what's the context? Okay. Verse 3. Here we go. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Now, let's go to reader relevance. Put yourself in the sandals of the disciples that day in this conversation that they're hearing Jesus Tell the Pharisees, Sadducees, 
teachers of the law, that hearing this, this, these woes, brood of vipers, you see these, these buildings? Yeah, not one's going to be left on another. Not one stone. So what is going through their brain? Imagine, you're talking about Herod's temple, God's house? Baffled. So now they're sitting on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is, is a hill that when you're on top of that hill, you're looking down directly to the temple. It's a perfect picture, perfect, perfect clear view on the mountaintop overlooking the city. So the disciples come to him private. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? When will what happen? The conversation they just heard and all this that's going to their mind. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age? Are they thinking in the year 2035? Are they thinking, are you, is there second coming in the year 2050? No. What, are there, what is their context? When are you coming back to do what you said you're going to do? When will this happen? And what's the sign of, uh, of, of the end of the age? See, a lot of times when we, when we hear like the end of the age or we immediately, we insert end of the world, right? Immediately we insert the end of the world. But that's not the context. How many of y'all heard of the Renaissance age? What was the Renaissance age? It was the age, it was a period in history, right? Um, what about the industrial age? You heard of the industrial age? Okay. What about the information age? Okay. So when I say Renaissance age, industrial age, information age, do we think end of the world? No. But we do it with this passage. You see what I'm saying? So the word age is actually a certain time period. And what this is referring to when the disciples are asking, when is the end of the age? What they're actually talking about is called the age of Moses. Also the age of the law. They're talking about when is the end of the law because that's where the temple, as long as this temple stands, this will stand. Does that make sense? So they're asking, when will this take place? So do you understand the context? Okay. So number one, you have to understand the event of 70 AD, you have to have reader relevance to get a proper historical context of the scriptures. You have to understand chapter 21, chapter 22, chapter 23, so you can fully appreciate chapter 24. Now, in Matthew 24, look at verse 34. Because Jesus goes on on Matthew 24 and he gives this because the disciples asked him three questions. When, when, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So those three questions, Jesus answers them specifically. But I love verse 34. What does the verse 34 say? Matthew 24, 34, 34 says, I tell you the truth. This. That's a very big word. This. It doesn't say that. Because scholars try to twist that word this. They take out the word this and they put the, they put the word that, meaning that these things are going to happen 
to the, to the generation that sees this signs. But that's not what Jesus is saying. I will tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. He's not saying that generation. He's saying this generation. What generation is he talking about? From 30 to 70, this generation is not going to pass away until you see all these things. What are the things that he's talking about? Read Matthew 24. These things had to have happened within that 40-year time period. If not, if not, if it did not happen within that generation, then Jesus is a false prophet. Jesus' credibility is on the line now. Am I making sense? So this generation will certainly not pass until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. See, and we think heaven and earth, we think literal heaven, we think literal earth is going to pass away. Okay? That's what we think. In the temple, you had the outer courts. What else? And what else? Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies was heaven. Inner courts was earth. Outer court was a sea. He is speaking their language. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. He is speaking the reader's language. Does that make sense? He's using their vocabulary. He's using their understanding. He's using their metaphors. He's using their symbolism to communicate a certain message that they would understand. It's not a physical heaven and a physical earth and a physical end of the world that's going to take place. He's talking about a destruction of a temple. I'm going to do away with this law of Moses because the law, of, the law is of Moses. It's not the law of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hmm. Now, <clears throat> when this was taking place in 70 AD, this was known as the Jewish Roman War. Let me let me make sure that I have it correctly. <clears throat> Okay, let me give you a little bit of history really fast. This was the Jewish-Roman War, also known as the Jewish Revolt. Okay. This was actually the first. <clears throat> now, what was taking place at this time was that the Jews were revolting or rebellion or rebelling against the Roman um, emperor under the Roman dominion. They were revolting and rebelling against it. Okay? So Nero, Nero, who was the emperor during that time, guys, there's a lot, there's a lot of history here. There's a lot of history that I can get into. Man, that it's very, very critical to our understanding of eschatology. 
Because this whole thing about Christians being persecuted and tribulation was all under the hand of Nero. Okay. The book of Revelation was written 68 and 69 AD. Between 68 and 69 AD. The book of Revelation. And one of the earliest manuscripts, the Septuagint, actually states in the book of Revelation, John writes that he's writing from the island of Patmos where he was put there by Nero himself. Nero sent John, the disciple, to the island of Patmos. And that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. Okay? He, that was in the early manuscripts. Now, one of the things that, that they called Nero, he was called the beast. They called him the beast. Okay? Again, I'm not going to get into all detail and, and, and just, I, I want to lay a foundation. So what was the mark of the beast? Right? We usually say 666. You've seen countless of movies about 666, about Halloween and about all this stuff. Right? This number is actually, it's not a, they're not single digit numbers. It's not six and then a six and a six. It's an action, it's an it's a number of accumulation. It's actually 666. Okay. Uh, see, I don't have time to, man. I'm like, I shouldn't have even brought that up, right? But I'm here. So Caesar Nero, Nero Caesar. If you were to write that name out. In Aramaic, they have a different um, a writing style, right? They have a different alphabet. And in their alphabet, their alphabet, um, every letter has a number assigned to it. Let me see if I can find it. I have it here. Let me see if I can find it really fast. I have it. I have it. I have it in my notes. Mm. How many of you ever heard of the, um, there's, and, and I had it for a long time for, there was a software. It was a burning, you use the software to burn CDs and DVDs. And the software was called Nero. It was Nero burning software. And if you saw the, the logo, um, it was like a flame or a fire. Okay. And that was actually named after Nero because he burned the city. And he would set a lot of Christians on fire. So that's why they called it Nero to burn CDs. But it was actually because of Nero. <clears throat> so when you write Nero's out in um, Aramaic and you add the numbers, because every, every letter had a number, okay? And when you write those numbers out and you add and you accumulate and you sum, you add all the numbers, you come out to 666. Okay? See, usually when I teach this, I have PowerPoint so people could see. And we do the addition. So I'm sorry if I didn't have my slides. <clears throat> so the mark of the beast was 666. So what Nero did was he had a statue. 
like kings do. Caesars do. They try to have statues of themselves. And they would do sacrifices. And you couldn't go in to the market to purchase, to sell, to anything, unless you went before that statue and you got before the statue, you took the ashes, and you put them on yourself because now you have the mark of the beast. And now you can go and trade and sell and do commerce. Okay. I'm just trying to give you context. Trying to give you context. So let me go back. So Nero, during this revolt, the Jews are revolting against Rome. And that's huge. So Rome goes out to siege Jerusalem. But around Jerusalem, you have different towns and villages around Jerusalem. Okay? And what Rome did, they would go in, destroy a town, go to the next one, destroy a village. They didn't go directly to Jerusalem first. Because they knew that when the people left, they were scattered to the next town. So they would go and destroy that town. Go to the next one, destroy that village. Because they knew that the people would run for safety to Jerusalem. And then they could surround it and destroy it. So, let's go to Matthew 24. Remember, Jesus is telling them, here's the sign of when these things are going to take place. I love verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He doesn't say flee to Jerusalem. Because he knows what's coming. Flee to the mountains. Don't go into the city. Let no one on the roof of a house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. Why? Because it's going to be surrounded. The army's going to come. They're going to surround it. Don't go into Jerusalem. Don't go into the temple. It's going to be destroyed. Flee. He says there's going to be... Wars and rumors of wars. Keep an eye out. Do you understand? Is this making sense so far? Okay. <clears throat> and see, one of the things that he says, it says, don't listen to false, to false Christ. Look, verse, um, verse 23. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miraculous and miracles to deceive even the elect. If that were possible, see, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, do not go out there. Or, here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. Why is he saying that? Because these false prophets and these false Christs, they're going to lead you, you're going to think, run to safety, come over here, and you're going to be trapped. Listen to my words. You see, so what Jesus is doing, he's letting his people, his followers know what's coming and how to get out of it. So this is not about destruction and the end of the world. This is about the end of the age of the law, the age of Moses. I don't have time to go into all of them right now, but 
One of the things that, that we do when we're, under, when we're studying Scripture is that we let Scripture interpret Scripture. Okay? That's one of the rules of proper context and Scriptures interpreting Scriptures. Okay? When people say, okay, the Son of Man will be coming on clouds, right? They usually think about, like, tribulation, rapture, second coming. Okay, remember, he's speaking to them and their language and what they're familiar with. Remember, keep this in mind, that the New Testament has not been written yet. As, as Jesus is sharing these things and saying these things, so they have no context for New Testament. The only context and understanding they have is Old Testament. So Jesus is using Old Testament language. So when he's saying, Does, you're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, what is he talking about? To understand what that means, you've got to go to the Old Testament and read every reference that talks about God coming on clouds. Does that make sense? And when you go to the Old Testament and you read where God is coming on clouds, okay, again, I don't have my PowerPoint and everything to show you and walk you through them, but you're going to find a theme. There's a thread that carries through every scripture reference that talks about God coming on clouds or riding on the wings of thunder or riding on the wings of cloud. And it always refers to God where one city is coming and destroying another city. You have to get that. So it doesn't mean physically that there's going to be a physical manifestation of God riding on the clouds. No, it's language. It's symbolism. It's metaphor. That means God is coming on the cloud. means that there's a judgment that's taking place. But it's God using a city or a kingdom coming to destroy another kingdom. Does that make sense? And so when Jesus is saying the Son of Man coming on clouds, what is he talking about? He's talking about Rome coming to destroy Jerusalem. Does that make sense? It's not, you know, the heavens open and, oh my gosh, there's Jesus right on the, you know, and this white horse and that, that's not what he's talking about. Context. Okay? Literature, language, the, the metaphors, the symbolism, the, the, the reader understanding of the Old Testament and what was used in the Old Testament gives proper context. Historical events give proper context. Does that make sense? So remember, <clears throat> in Daniel, that there's a hand that cuts out a stone from the mountain and throws it at the feet of the statue. And that statue comes crumbling down. That statue is actually a historical timeline, okay, of kingdoms that will proceed another kingdom, right? Babylon, Greeks, Media Persia, Romans, okay? And that stone, in Daniel, it says that that stone becomes a mountain. And that mountain is the kingdom of God. That stone was cast down at the birth of Jesus. That stone came at the time of the Romans, which are the feet of the statue. And ever since, the kingdom of God has been increasing and advancing. And that stone can only become a mountain because the son can only do and the son can only say what he sees the father do and what he, see, what he hears the father say. It can only produce and manifest that which is his substance. So the kingdom can only advance and the kingdom can only increase. So these passages, when it comes to end-time eschatology, when it comes to destruction of the world, it cannot exist when you understand the kingdom. 
it clashes. So what's going to triumph? The kingdom that you surrender everything that I ever thought I ever knew, everything that I've always been familiar with, everything that I've always heard, I've always heard this interpretation of these scriptures, but the kingdom is advancing and has gripped me and it's shaking me that these scriptures, I have to face them on. I have to take on those scriptures that talk about eschatology. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we're in a time right now where we're going in to possess the land. And we're no longer grasshoppers. We're not grasshoppers. We were never grasshoppers. Amen? So, <clears throat> we'll pause there. Again, this is just an introduction. I know I took a long time. Um, there's so much more that we can cover and go into, into the book of Revelation. Did Jesus lie? Is he a false prophet? Absolutely not. He said, this generation will not pass until all these things happen. And he nailed it. 40 years is a generation. He waited in his patience to the last minute. To say, okay, it's time to close this. And the only thing that exists is the new covenant that was established, which was a new covenant. Right? That's why in Hebrews it talks about how <clears throat> there's one that's coming to an end, that is becoming obsolete. But then there's one that stands forever. And that's the new covenant that we're in, and that's the kingdom. Amen? So, guys, I pray that you guys were blessed with this. Um, again, this is the introduction. I know that there's going to be so much more that's going to be coming in the near future. There's courses and classes and things that we're going to be doing. <clears throat> we want to bring understanding, uh, a healthy perspective on the times that we're in, about who we are, about what, what, what Jesus has accomplished, and, and what, what we're able to do in advancing the kingdom of God. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for those that have been watching. Lord, I pray for um, just uh, a healthy perspective, a healthy understanding, Lord. Father, even right now, Lord, we just give you permission. We give you permission, Lord. Father, right now, we just give you permission. We surrender. Every thought, every idea, every concept, every belief, Everything that we've ever heard, God, that is outside the context of your kingdom, Lord, or that doesn't line up to your advancing, ever-increasing, a kingdom that doesn't back down, Lord, a kingdom that, that, that will continue to advance. Lord, if there's anything outside of that, Lord, we give you permission. We give you permission, Lord. We lay it down, Lord. We give you permission. To put that thing to rest. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your guidance. Holy Spirit, we thank you because you lead us into all truth. And your truth is never contrary to your nature. It's never contrary to your character. It's never contrary to, to your advancing. Father, any thought, any idea... that empowers a defeated enemy. We surrender it right now, Lord. We surrender it right now. We would not empower a disempowered devil, Lord. We surrender it right now, Father. Father, you call us to be the light and the salt. We are the revelation. And we are the, preser uh, the, the preservation. We are light and we are salt. We are revelation. We are preservation. We make that that you made good, we keep it good. 
And Lord, when you rested and you look back at everything that you made on this earth, you said it's all good. There is no destruction in our future, Lord. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for giving us understanding. Father, we love you. We bless your people. We thank you for those that are watching, that have been tuned in, Lord. We ask them to be blessed. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys on Wednesday night, 730. Amen. God bless you. See y'all.